hot March morning in the flatlands of the San Fernando Valley. Ten of us are training in a small matted space behind a yoga studio. A chain link fence surrounds the mat, a heavy gate swings in the occasional breeze. My instructor, Sifu Alain, rents the space for classes with a small group of students. Borrowing the parlance of UFC and other MMA competitions, I've taken to calling the space Alain's cage. We open the class with rounds of sparring. We start out light and slow, our contact barely more than a touch. I'm working with Roland, a more senior student. He's more skilled than me, but gentle in nature, and I find even moving slow, I can use that to get a way in. But Roland's got a good repertoire of moves. Responding to them is hard work, and the rounds are long. My stamina drops, returns, drops again. Dig deep, Alain says. You guys are fighters. Now, in common parlance, I'd be happy to claim the title of uh, descriptor of fighter with its connotations of resilience and determination and toughness. When it comes to martial arts, not so much. Because, as you know, in martial arts, fighter has somewhat more specific connotations. I'm connoting a competitive athlete, someone like Coach Kathy Long here. Someone who participates in public bouts on a regular basis. What separates a fighter from a fighter, um, if you'll forgive the air quotes, is competition. The realized intention to take martial arts off the mat and into the ring or the cage. For a fighter, in this narrower sense, martial arts belongs not only to the informal setting of the dojo academy or gym, but to the performance space of sport. For someone like me, competition's an attitude, as in a competitive spirit. For a fighter, it is an action undertaken as part of an organized and possibly institutionalized event. So this presentation takes this difference as a starting point, exploring the multiple connotations of competition within the overlapping spheres of play, game, and sports. In line with sports sociologists and historians, um, I will argue that sport emphasizes outcome. In other words, sport tends to be about winning or losing rather than process, how the game is played. Hence my opening quotes. I suggest that attention to physical, contestatory, and exploratory interactions between people can actually offset a cultural overemphasis on winning. Um, I also want to suggest that an intentional claiming of the category of the amateur with its intention to, attention to experimentation can play a role in this process, as can a reconsideration of the significance of failure. So as you might have guessed from my opening description, sparring is both a dominant metaphor for this investigation um, as well as a primary example. This presentation is part of a larger project um, in which I investigate the relationship between risk, failure, and play, and their relationship to creativity and adaptability. And I'm looking at this idea through the example of martial arts. Um, as you can also probably gather from my opening example, I'm doing this through the genre of ethnographic memoir. So I'm reflecting quite a bit on my own learning process. Um, as it reveals insights about the larger significance of the practice. Um, in keeping with the phenomenological and ethnographic traditions that I'm drawing from, I interpret out from my own experience to examine the relative weight given to winning and losing in a range of physical activities, as well as the relationship between individual mastery and interpersonal interaction in combative play. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at with this larger project is like trying to theorize enjoyment. Because um, play and enjoyment tend to be trivialized in Western capitalist societies, but a lot of the, the like, um, social science and um, biological science research that I'm drawing from indicates that play is absolutely crucial for human experience. Um, and you know, we've, heard, we've heard quite a bit about um, motivation today. Um, and we've heard about like, these external reasons that we're often um, 
given for practicing martial arts or the reasons why people come to martial arts training, send their kids to martial arts training. Um, but one of the things we don't talk all that much about is play and fun. Um, and I'm really interested in like, you know, I really love martial arts and I really love sparring. And what is it about like getting in there and not just getting hit, get, um, hitting people and kicking them, but getting hit and getting kicked that keeps me coming back for more. Um, so what I want to sort of explore is um, what is this, the role of enjoyment in combat arts and the many ways in which we distinguish combat arts from real violence and what that distinction reveals about larger societal concerns um, as well as our sort of societal um, opportunities for interpersonal play. Um, one little caveat in talking about martial arts and sparring, I'm obviously talking primarily about martial arts that have a sparring component. Um, I'm talking largely about martial arts that in some way function as sports. Um, so I'm not talking about um, combat battlefield arts like Filipino martial arts or ninjutsu. Um, I'm not talking about arts that have a more spiritual or aesthetic function. Um, so I'm really talking about like the sport fighting, the larger sport fighting subset. And I hope you'll bear with me because I will say martial arts and sport fighting interchangeably, recognizing that they're different. I'm training with Vincent. It's a small class, only four of us. And Vincent and I are the only ones with gear. We get ready to spar. I'm nervous. Vincent has an intensity level that's similar to mine, but he's more skilled than I am. He trains more than I do, and he's always several steps ahead of me. And he's younger, as in decades younger. Vincent gets in a lot of shots at the beginning. He's fast, and he strategizes well. He fakes me out. He keeps his head moving, so he's hard to hit. His feet move with a fragmented rhythm, so I have trouble gauging exactly where he is and where he's going. He lands a hard strike. I feel a surge of anger, and before I can stop myself, I rush in, only to end up in a headlock. He takes me down with a sweep kick and gets me on the ground in side control. I'm so tired that I can't get his weight off of me. All I can do is grab his biceps so he can't hit, can't get me into a submission. I shrimp out, and we're back on our feet. Eventually, I find my moment. I come at Vincent with a sweeping right hammer fist. It's big, and it's obvious, and I know he's going to evade it. It's a setup, but I haven't figured out yet what for. I'm hoping he'll come to me in these moments that are flying by so fast. Vincent bobs and weaves, tight and crisp, right underneath my strike. He comes up out of the evasion just as I reverse course with a right back fist that hits him square in the face. It's a move I learned in a form many years ago in a traditional kung fu class. Somehow I managed to drag it out from deep in my memory at a moment where it fits perfectly, like a long lost puzzle piece completing a picture. As a live practice, sparring allows opponents to challenge each other's tactics and strategies, contesting efforts to strike, take one another down, or execute a submission. Sparring contrasts, obviously, with drills, in which movements are planned, in which partners allow each other to execute particular moves. But sparring also differs from competition fighting, in that sparring is an exploratory training activity. Its purpose is learning, rather than achieving the desired end. The verb to spar carries a number of connotations. Um, it, it generally is defined, like the Merriam-Webster dictionary here, it's, it's defined as light fighting, or um, almost like imitation fighting. Um, but as I'm sure many of you know, real sparring matches vary enormously in intensity, um, ranging from stalking and um, kind of miming strikes to lightly landing blows to hitting and kicking with a force and speed that rivals competition fighting. So what I think is the real fundamental difference between sparring and competition sport fighting is the lack of a specific outcome and the lack of a clear designated winner. So it's not win about winning and losing in a sparring match. So for me, this is why sparring in particular is really interesting for looking at the differences between play, games, and sports. So 
I'm suggesting that sparring is a form of play and kind of in line with um, a number of game theorists and play theorists, I'm suggesting that sparring is play primarily because it's intrinsically valuable. We do it for its own purposes. Yes, it's a form of training. Um, yes, we do it often to learn from it. But primarily, we're not doing it to serve an external purpose. We do it for its own reasons. So like other forms of play, it's worthwhile in itself. So those of us who don't compete, we still spar. And we do this certainly to challenge ourselves, but we also do it for enjoyment. Sparring in game theory terms is also a game because it has rules, parameters, and it has goals. Even though it's not necessarily about extrinsic purposes, it still has a goal that is internal to the game. Often we play to win even as we don't necessarily acknowledge a winner. It's a little bit of paradox there, but games are actually built around paradox. It's very central to what a game is. We play within the rules because failing to do so wouldn't just be poor etiquette. It would mean we were no longer playing. Um, sparring is not the only kind of game that can involve a degree of confrontation and danger. Um, games of a various, of a variety of sorts, often involve a confrontation, um, either with another player or with an obstacle. So, um, as philosopher Bernard, uh, Bernard Suits points out, games often also rely on intentionally inefficient means of solving the problem. So, like, a soccer player kicks a ball when it would be much more efficient to just pick it up and run with it, right? Um, a runner agrees to run around a track, whereas if the only goal was to get there ahead of the competitors, they would just cut right across the middle, right? Um, so, likewise, you know, martial artists, they, they circle, they uh, kick, they search for a takedown when they could just be jabbing each other in the eyes. Um, and that's the sort of thing, a, an eye gouge or a shot to the trachea would make sense in the outside world if it were real violence. But in the function, in the sport function, it actually would nullify the game. It would render it something other than a game. So um, Suits argues that although all games rely on inefficient means, they divide into open and closed games according to their outcomes. So an open game has no inherent or explicit goal whose achievement ends the game. Whereas closed games have a clear objective, the achievement of which results in winning. So this is the distinction I'm kind of seeing between sparring and competition fighting. Right? Like sparring, I, as I see it, is an open game, whereas competition sport fighting is a closed game. Although sparring differs from sport fighting, it echoes the competition context and thus evokes some of the attributes of sports. A striving for excellence by a contest between contenders, for instance. Um, sports tend to refine and essentialize games. So a game is often about the tension between playing and winning. That's kind of what competitive pleasure is within a game, right? We kind of we want to win, but we also want to sustain the game. Often we'll seed an easy victory to keep a game going. Um, whereas sports tilt the balance towards success. So an, an athlete typically does not seed an easy victory just to keep the game going. Um, but sports retain the inefficient means of games, like um, a pole vaulter launches themselves over a bar when they could walk around it. Um, Similarly, sport fighters kick and punch, but they don't grab chairs out of the stands and start swinging them at their opponents. So um, sports like games, although sports refine and essentialize games, like games, they're still about experience. They're still immersive. To be played with any degree of skill, let alone enjoyment, sports require that athletes get in the zone. And like what we talk about in sports as being in the zone is really similar to what phenomenologists are talking about when they describe transcendence. That immersive state of full attention in which one is moving in and through the body 
um, rather than being hampered by a sense of trying to figure out how to do something. Um, this is also a state that economist Daniel Kahneman calls effortless attending, um, and psychologist Mihaly Six Sixsense Mihaly calls flow, a complete immersion in the activity at hand, where the relationship to the body, to one's own body, to an instrument or tool is seamless. For co competitive athletes, however, the immersive experience is channeled towards winning, finishing the race ahead of other competitors, besting the opponent in the ring, accumulating the points required to succeed. And that's uh, precisely what's interesting about athletics is that it requires a full immersion in the moment, in the activity, at hand with a simultaneous awareness of the outcome. In addition to the relative importance of goals, the presence of viewers, especially those with a formal relationship to the event, so ticket holders versus informal observers, for instance, turns the activity from a game into a sport. If no one's watching, it's just a game. Even if the players compete against each other, even if their competition is fierce, um, and even if they do decide to keep score or acknowledge a winner at the end. Um, now, this may be because I'm a dance scholar and I'm interested in performance, but I can't help but see the presence of spectators as a defining feature of sport. And, and I don't think I'm really alone in this um, idea that visual display and these sort of narrative highs and lows um, define sport as what it is. Um, so, for example, like um, Malcolm Gladwell described the liveness of sport as, quote, the drama of, of athletic competition. Um, sociologist Francesco Duina um, compares sports to performance, saying, the more drama we witness, the more delighted we are. Um, and I think we can see that in a lot of sports matches, a lot of how the commentators describe it, how it's talked about after the fact. There's this idea that there is sort of a, a narrative arc to a sport event. Um, the more spectacularized the sport, the less the interior experience of the athlete seems to matter in the evaluation of the event. Um, I, I suspect that because watching is so important in sports, the audience's pleasure in viewing takes precedence over the enjoyment of the athletes. While athletes, certainly we hope, experience competitive pleasure, and certainly many of them seem to, viewers care more about what they see rather than what the athlete feels. Viewers, in other words, they focus on what athletes do, not on what they experience. If the goal for an athlete is to get into and remain in the zone, moving in phenomenological terms from imminence towards transcendence, the goal for the audience is to see transcendence at work. So there, there's a paradox here. Like the activity appears effortless even as we see the sweat and the dirt and in martial arts, the blood of the effort. Because the emphasis on outcome orients sports toward an end goal more than the experience, um, sports sociologists have argued that sport is kind of placed in this complex way between work and play, that it's simultaneously a form of work at the same time that it's a game. In other words, like play emphasizes process, whereas work demands a product. So um, sports sociologist Stanley Eitzen, for example, um, argues that the commercialization of sport and its emphasis on product over process turns play into work. And the product in this situation is the desired outcome, winning. Um, what's, what's really striking to me about this is like as someone who moves between dance and sport, it's like we have this disparagement of losing in sports but failure is so necessary to sports. They make sports what they are. Um, like, for example, in dance, in all but the most experimental forms of choreography, movement is made to appear effortless. It's supposed to be seamless. The rendition of the choreography is supposed to be completely continuous. So even though we have things like modern dance that emphasize effort, we don't really attend to failure in dance. We try to mask it as much as possible. 
Whereas in sports, where the goal, you know, broadly speaking, is to win, failure is right there front and center. You know, and that's actually what makes sports interesting. So when players confront each other, one-on-one -on -one or as part of a team, they're, they're trying to trip each other up. They're projecting one action only to take another. You know, they fake each other out. Right? Um, and that's true not just of martial arts, but a lot of other sports, um, a lot of team sports, for example. So if you think about it in a certain way, faking out your opponent means that failure is inevitable. And failure is also what makes the game interesting. It's the fumbled play, the ball that barely clears the net and forces the opponent to run forward and miss. In martial arts, I, I think this is even more apparent. The kick that's evaded and countered, the punch that starts strong but is skillfully evaded, the takedown that's reversed. So what I'm trying to get at here is that losing is necessary to competition. It authorizes and enables the game. Everyone participating, everyone watching knows that there will be winners and there will be losers. And yet losing in modern sports is often treated as shameful. So we only need to think of like the taunts hurled at losing teams um, or recently Holly Holmes defeat of Ronda Rousey and like the, the endless trolling that went on of you know the disparagement of this former champion as a loser um, to get a sense for like how shameful competitive failure is treated and so we have this like odd situation in which modern sport condemns failure even though failure is necessary for success My opponent, Rod, is a young guy, a regular attendee in kickboxing classes, and an occasional competitor. At the academy, I'm a little dragon's mom and a professor who does research on something related to martial arts. I'm not a competition fighter. I can tell Rod knows this, because he starts out light, moving slow, wondering, I suspect, if he'll need to bring the sparring down to a teaching level. I tighten up my footwork and get my head moving. We circle, skipping around each other. I throw out a few jabs, not too aggressive, because he showed me the courtesy of a wait and see approach, and it would hardly be fair by run, to respond by running him down. I land a few shots, light and controlled. I'm just touching him. But it's a signal. Let's go. Let's bring it up. He throws out a jab, converts it to a hook. It lands, solid, on my cheek. He fakes low, lands high. He circles briskly, but drops his guard. I land a cross straight to his nose. By the end of the round, we're smiling. When we touch gloves and hug, the joy of competing is bubbling, effervescent. I call this process of coming together through cooperative, controlled opposition, finding the meeting point. Since sparring can involve ev anything from non-contact stalking and looking for openings without landing punches to light contact, touching the opponent at the target zo zones, to competition level force, the first thing that has to happen the partners have to decide how hard they want to play. Do they want this to be training for the ring or to feel like it? Or do they want to have the space to explore without the anxiety that, well, comes with getting hit hard in the face? The two partners also have to figure out how to deal with each other's energy. Match it, diffuse it, meet it with its opposite. Sometimes it's effective to meet aggression with the same, but other times, Countering like with like just builds into a brush fire. We need to figure out how to handle a hesitant or unskilled opponent. Do we bring up the intensity to see if he's willing to play a little harder, or to create space, giving him an in so he feels more confident, try something out? The negotiation happens around the skills an opponent has. We, we figure out whether to try to match an opponent's speed or just cover and take it until she leaves the opening that allows for a response. We determine how to deal with an opponent who uses a lot of force and one who fakes us out a lot, using our force against us. Finding the meeting point entails deciphering an opponent's signature moves, preparing for her favorite attacks, figuring out her preferred defenses. In hybrid martial arts in particular, it means scanning for indications of their training. Does he come from a traditional karate background? Or has she practiced mostly grappling and will she be, she lo she be looking to take me down? And determining what those traces of training suggest. Will that sidekick be followed by a spinning back fist? 
Or does that high guard and upright torso mean that hard tie kicks will follow? Finding the meeting point also means acknowledging an opponent's abilities and accomplishments without jealousy, self-aggrandizement, or self-disparagement. It means attending to process, even as the end goal, hitting or evading the hit, remains vital. This no-ego ideal seems antithetical to the aggressive dynamic practice of sport fighting, and yet it's central. Attending to what philosopher Aaron Manning describes as, quote, the means rather than the end, takes precedence, even as the end, landing the strike, remains crucially important. <coughs> the process of finding the meeting point and of cooperatively developing the means through which we can compete is, I think, a physical realization of the concept that philosophers refer to as intersubjectivity. Um, to kind of do like a nutshell summary of phenomenology, if I can you know, do that in like you know, 30 seconds, um, I would propose it this way. The Western intellectual tradition has tended to privilege the mind. I mean, that's pretty obvious. We're all people who work with the body, and so we kind of have that a little bit of like, yeah, we always have that Cartesian thing of the mind versus the body, and you know, I think, therefore I am, and that kind of thing. Um, phenomenology, one of the reasons why phenomenology is of interest, I think, to a lot of people who are working with sport, dance, theater, um, is that it broke from this tradition. Um, so particularly Merleau-Ponty's idea that like, the self is constructed through experience. Um, so the phenomenologist, you know, generally speaking, rejects this idea of I think, therefore I am, and replaces it more with I am because I perceive, I intend, and I experience. Um, phenomenologists generally assert that we know who we are through our experience of transcendence, of mastery, of physical mastery, our body's seamless execution of our will, the ability of our bodies to just act as an expression or an extension of our intention. In other words, like what phenomenologists tend to say is that um, mastery is what makes us a self in the world. Um, some phenomenologists certainly attend to the senses, um, as Philip was talking about yesterday, I and mean, it's a very important arena of phenomenological um, theorization. But for others, it's intention towards objects and the resulting movement that distinguishes the self. And for what I'm working on, that, that's a little bit more closely related. Um, for many phenomenologists, we understand ourselves through like the apparent effortlessness through which we, you know, walk across the room or pick up a pencil to write down our thoughts. So if our existence is primarily about extending ourselves into the world and extending ourselves through objects, um, one of the questions that comes up for phenomenology is what happens when we encounter other people, right? Because people don't really just operate as extensions of our will. Or, as Bruce Lee says in Enter the Dragon, boards don't hit back. So um, this insight, I mean, one of the reasons why it's oft quoted is that like, it's not restricted to, spite, to fight sports. In interpersonal relationships, in collaborative work, in physical play of all kinds, in merely moving through public space, we get a pretty clear indication that other people are exercising their will, which causes us to constantly reappraise and refigure our tactics and our strategies. Because of the quandary created by other people's will, phenomenologists emphasize intersubjectivity, as well as experience, intention, and mastery. So in that sense, intersubjectivity in its most general sense is putting ourselves in somebody else's place. Um, and it comes out of realizing that other people's frames of reference are basically the same, left, right, up, down, front, back. Um, recognizing that they exercise their intentionality in similar ways, but also realizing that they do something fundamentally very different with this information. So um, Aaron Manning, who's a philosopher, um, writes a lot about intersubjectivity through movement, and she takes tango as her primary example. Um, she argues that the coming together of people through physical touch allows individuals to experiment with difference and disagreement, as well as harmony. So Manning puts forward this idea of consensus, which is not necessarily the same thing as agreement. Consensus, for her, can entail managing and benefiting from disagreement. 
In other words, cooperation doesn't have to mean that everyone's the same. It doesn't mean that everyone gets along, even. It can entail managing difference, dissent, and opposition. So um, I think there's some apl applicability here to talking about games and sports. Um, Henning Eitberg makes a kind of similar point about games. Um, and he suggests that games erode a dualism between subject and object. Maintaining that when we play a game, the game plays us as well. Um, so Eichberg suggesting that this subject-object boundary gets unraveled through play, um, and that play also dismantles the idea of the autonomous subject, just um, bending the world to his or her will. Um, games, especially physical games, bring us into an interaction with other human beings that is often both cooperative and competitive. And so they give us the opportunity to practice disagreement without conflict. Now, I want to emphasize the word opportunity because we can see very clearly from sports that this fails a lot, right? So we see violence associated with sports, um, violence committed by athletes, and also violence at sports games. So it's an opportunity to practice disagreement with respect. It doesn't mean everybody always takes that opportunity. So um, to my mind, sparring exemplifies the opportunities that are offered by this interpersonal interaction or intersubjective engagement. Um, sparring brings us into direct confrontation with other people in sometimes quite painful ways. Um, sparring reminds us in really immediate kinds of ways that we're not just individuals carrying out our own agenda. The oppositional force of another human being is a pretty potent reminder that we don't just bend the world to our will. And likewise, we have the opportunity to remind others that they are not just bending the world to their will. And following on then from Eichberg's assertion about games, it's not just the game that plays us. Our opponents play us as well. And by play, I mean this in, in three senses, you know, in that um, play can mean exercising a fluid, responsive mastery. It can mean working out the game with, uh, with it. And it can mean trying to best us. Similarly, we play our opponents. So in that sense, what I'm suggesting is that controlled opposition reminds us that we are not alone in the world. Sparring teaches us that even when human interaction is not harmonious, it can still be managed. Sometimes so both sides are satisfied, even if one side's weaknesses are more apparent. Coming into contact with others can be euphoric, but it can also be painful, challenging, and infuriating. Sparring, in this sense, illustrates the complexity of human interaction. A realization that challenges, I think, an emphasis on winning as the only desirable outcome. An emphasis on intersubjectivity, on experience and process, can shift a balance away from winning for its own sake and back toward competitive pleasure. And I think that this is important not only within sparring. I think this has a significance for a broader cultural, cultural context. So like we can value competitive pleasure as an aspect of play for its own sake, even as we long for particular outcomes. Like we can desire the outcome, but still value the process. Excellence and achievement can be measured not only in terms of wins and losses, but also in terms of a game well played. Right? Like hence that opening quote of not that you want or lose, but how you, how you played the game. We could privilege the counter competitive attributes of play, like unity and participation. I mean, that's one of the things about sports that's um, an internal but highly effective paradox is that people achieve unity and cooperation through sports even as they're working towards a competitive outcome. In, real, in returning to a basis of sports and play, we can realize that physical interaction and play are actually intrinsically valuable. They don't just need to serve the purpose of winning. Now, in saying this, I am not arguing that every participant should get a medal. Um, I think this is particularly a thing in the United States, but it's starting to become a phenomenon internationally. Um, 
And it's often put forward in children's sports, like, oh, kids' sports are getting too competitive, so everyone should get a medal. And I think the problem with that idea is that it still retains the idea that losing is shameful, right? Because it is a competitive event. And maybe it's OK to lose. Maybe it's OK to fail. And if we give everyone a medal, then we have that curious situation where it's like, well, we can't even like, mention the fact that there have been wins and losses, um, which I think actually replicates the same problem that it's trying to address. So what I'm trying to get at is that failure in the outcome is not the same thing as failure in the process. Um, I think a really good, when I talk about this with my students, they're always like, well, OK, if you don't like the whole everyone gets a medal, like, what are you suggesting in its place? I think marathon running is a really good example of valuing outcome and valuing process at the same time. Because finishing a marathon is so clearly a form of success that, like, yeah, there are people who are high-level elite runners, and yes, th those people absolutely care about who's first over the finish line. But really, anyone who can run a marathon, I mean, come on, that's an achievement, right? And so I think that kind of simultaneous attention to effort, process, and outcome is what we need more of societally. Um, in writing about alternatives to occur our current mode of competition, um, Francesco Duina makes a similar point, which is that striving in itself matters. Um, he describes it as the pursuit of something, regardless of outcome, holds meaning in and of itself. Um, and he's kind of getting across this idea that the pursuit of a goal is an act of imagination. It's kind of a similar point to that which um, Elaine Scarry makes about work, that it's about bringing into being something that did not exist before. And so it can si simultaneously be about outcome and process. So Duina suggests that we could value competition not for its outcome, but because it provides an opportunity to envision possibilities, possible futures, and to pursue those possibilities. The relationship between competition and imagination suggests that intersubjectivity alone is not sufficient for offsetting an obsession with winning. Professional athletes and the coaches that guide them have plenty of experience with intersubjective interaction and controlled opposition. In team sports, often the, the intersubjective um, experience, it, it kind of generates like camaraderie within the team, but that doesn't extend to people outside of the team. So we can see examples of where high-level amateur athletes and professional athletes commit horrible acts of violence with seeming impunity because of their exalted status. So they're not really carrying forward that lesson of intersubjective or interpersonal interaction um, to the society outside the category of the professional athlete. So often, um, they, uh, professional high-level amateur athletes retain an unmodified attitude toward competition. Um, creating situations where winning matters more than sporting behavior ethics. So the whole, that whole idea of like it only matters if the ref sees it, right? That's an example where in, just by virtue of there being intersubjective interaction, um, it's not necessarily yielding ethical or um, community-oriented behavior. So the next step of this is that intersubjectivity in the presence of introspection can offset the winning at all costs mentality that feeds into the impunity with which professional and high level amateur athletes and their fans you know, may commit acts of violence and um, disregard codes of ethics, as well as the sort of just general societal overemphasis on winning that yields um, a great deal of discomfort around children's sports and excess attention to excess. And introspection, interestingly, tends to be associated with failure. So that's where I'm getting into this thing of like reclaiming the possibilities associated with failure. So sparring, like other physical interpersonal encounters, and things like social dance, one-on-one -on -one basketball, pickup games of soccer, can illuminate what physical interaction reveals about difference and disagreement. Physical practices where we need to find the meeting point remind us of the physical realities of other human beings, their strengths, their strategies, and their vulnerabilities. It creates a space for exploring oppositional intent without succumbing to anger and without giving up. Introspection can shed light on why intersubjectivity is important. 
It includes looking to our physical interactions as metaphors, as well as learning experiences. It consists asking not just what, what can I do better, or what are the flaws as well as the strengths of my game, but also what have I learned about myself? What do these interactions tell me about how I engage with others? What do they reveal in others that surprises me? Commentators on competition outline the detrimental effects of failure, noting that winners' views on the world are confirmed, while losers are fraught with doubt. Losers, so the saying goes, are left to their own introspection. We often accept losing as a learning experience. We accept it particularly when it's positioned as a learning experience. So um, losers are often, they retreat from competition to think about how they can improve. And we often stop disparaging losing when we see it as a dip in a narrative. So, so often in terms of how sports are described and even in general when we look at like, societal constructions of success, there's this idea that losing at a certain point in the narrative is okay as long as it's just a dip in the narrative that ultimately goes on to success. Um, so there's this kind of idea that like introspection is a negative consequence of losing. But I want to like rethink that a little bit. And instead suggest that introspection can be a positive outcome associated with failure. That there's a disappointing outcome that happens with failure, but also generative possibilities that come out of introspection. So I'm suggesting that introspection combined with intersubjectivity can allow us to see beyond the dualistic win-lose mode of competition and can instead position us toward a greater understanding of the complexities of human interaction. So if professional sports have moved too far for, toward outcome and away from reflective intersubjective practice, will shifting a balance from watching to participating rectify this? Can we support the process of playing as actively as we do the spectacle of sports? In other words, is there a place for amateurism? The term amateur tends to carry um, negative connotations. So um, its very origins are exclusionary. Elites invented the term in the 19th century to separate working class sports with their emphasis on leisure and free time um, from the regulated competition oriented practices of the upper classes. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, an amateur means both someone who undertakes an activity for pleasure rather than their job, but it also means an incompetent. It means someone who does something poorly. Like if you think about someone will say that that sort of, that, that was an amateur job or that was a really amateur kind of approach. Um, if, you, if then move on from like the Merriam-Webster dictionary to the Merriam-Webster thesaurus and start looking up synonyms, you get like incompetent, bumbler, unskilled, inexpert, dilettante, clumsy, which is really strange because amateur comes from the word love, right? That's like the root of it. It means someone who does something because they adore the activity. So it's a kind of strange thing that amateur implies half-hearted at the same time that its roots are like about being devoted to a particular activity. So I think there's something really interesting here about reclaiming the idea of acting, practicing, performing from love rather than duty. And I think there's also something promising about renouncing the idea that deep engagement requires orientation toward a goal. So, um, arts and African-American studies scholar Sarah Lewis, um, author of a 2014 book called The Rise, um, sort of agrees with this idea. And she actually takes it several steps further. Um, she puts forward this idea called intentional amateurism. Um, and she argues that intentional amateurism is a strategy through which unexpected discoveries can emerge. Um, and she talks about, I mean, she has a, a whole range of wonderful examples. And um, one of them is the physicist Andre Geim, who um, he won a Nobel Prize for the first ever 
isolation of grapheme, which is the only two-dimensional surface, the only two-dimensional object ever identified on Earth. And um, Guyman and his colleagues made this discovery because they, they did these things called Friday night labs, where they would just get together and like mess around in the laboratory and try out a bunch of different things, try out things that they would never do as part of their real job, where they had to like get funding and run studies and write papers. Um, and so they sort of made this extraordinary discovery through something that was resolutely amateur, that they were just doing for the love of it. Um, and so Lewis calls this um, grazing shallow. Um, and she talks about how amateur practice can generate questions that others never bother to ask. So um, Lewis compares this to the Zen concept of the beginner's mind. Um, the attempt to view circumstances with the fresh approach of the novice. Um, not surprisingly, Lewis also links this sense of wonder to play. Um, she talks about this idea of the intentional amateur's constant now, which, like play, is immersive. It's about process and not product. Um, and in this case, this, this has a really important relationship to failure because the constant now of the intentional amateur is really not concerned with failure. It's not about losing or winning. Failure is only one possible outcome among many. So reading the rise and reading about this idea of the intentional amateur, um, I was reminded of martial arts iconoclast Bruce Lee. Um, and I realize I've worked in two slides of Bruce Lee into this presentation. I could, just couldn't resist the opportunity to do so. Um, and I fully acknowledge my geekiness around that point. Um, so Bruce Lee, obviously, in some ways, was not an amateur. I mean, like, the incredible rigor that he brought to martial arts training, the, the sort of um, relentless training regimen that he put himself through. I mean, in that sense, he is anything but an amateur. Um, certainly in any of those senses of sort of a dilettante, awkward, clumsy. Um, but if we think about this idea of grazing shallow, then Bruce Lee fits the bill perfectly. Um, as many of you know, Bruce Lee rejected martial arts training methods that were rooted in secrecy. Um, he rejected the idea of absolute devotion to a teacher and the adherence to a single system. He rejected the idea that the teacher had absolute authority. Um, but at the same time, Bruce Lee had the courage to do what we now blithely call cross-training. Um, he convinced Ip Man to, to train him in Wing Chun, even though he had you know, been a professional social dancer. And um, as the rumor has it, um, his part German ancestry excluded him from any traditional kung fu systems. Um, but then he went on to watch Muhammad Ali's footwork and alter his Wing Chun training, um, honing his dexterity and mobility, um, shifting away from Wing Chun's grounded inside attack. Um, while retaining its angularity and its power. Um, he recently studied a range of martial arts. He was one of the first non-Thais to study Muay Thai. He studied all different forms of wrestling. He had Danny and Santo teach him stick fighting. Um, and he sought to extract what was most effective in each, um, drawing together Western boxing, fencing, Wing Chun, Kung Fu snack kicks, a little bit from grappling systems such as judo and Greco-Roman wrestling. So in that process, he created Jun Fong Kung Fu, and then he also created a system, Jeet Kune Do, through which, as he famously put it, take what it pract practitioners can take what is useful, leave what is useless, and make it your own. At the Inosanto Academy of Martial Arts, I've had the privilege of training under Bruce Lee's closest friend and student and collaborator, Guru Dan Inosanto. When watching Guru Inosanto, I'm constantly reminded of the genius produced by the willingness to graze shallow as well as to dig deep. In Filipino martial arts um, class, for example, Danny Inosanto moves swiftly between training systems as well as between stick, blade, sword, and staff methods. He'll be teaching a Filipino martial arts class and then he'll draw from Silat and he'll bring in something from Muay Thai and then he'll bring in multiple different um, systems from within the Filipino martial arts training. 
And at the same time, I've heard him linger over the nuances of the paksau, the slapping block. That's one of the most rudimentary moves in the Wing Chun system. Inosanto's classes are often an, ex an exercise in beginner's mind just because he moves so quickly from talking about silat to modern Muay Thai in back-to-back -back drills, all the while reminding us that we're on our own journey, urging us not just to practice, but to figure it out. Such strategies, I think, of the simultaneous expert and intentional amateur in Lewis's sense, create space for introspection. They open the practitioner to failure. In fact, in some ways, they're designed to put us in a position where we're going to fail. And in doing so, they acknowledge that failure is necessary and sometimes informative. This sort of attention to grazing shallow, this sort of embrace of a certain kind of whimsy, placed alongside digging deep, can allow us to rethink risk and failure. And it might, I want to suggest, even mitigate the disparagement of losing. This, the overemphasis on winning is part of the institutionalization of sport. This is something that sports historians and sports ethnographers have tended to research in some detail. That, um, like for example, as Stanley Eitzen argues, the highly structured, organized nature of contemporary sports um, kind of requires winning, and it requires that it be about outcome. Um, and it, it tends to evacuate the very things that make sports pleasurable. Creativity, playful exploration, um, enjoyment, self-expression, inventiveness, all these things kind of diminish as sports become institutionalized and become more focused on specialization, money-driven concerns, and external decision-making. In other words, what I'm getting at is too much con competition can curtail play. So this raises the question of whether the pursuit of competitive pleasure can demand our best while allowing for failure. Can we accept failure, celebrate it, even while striving for mastery? Can we acknowledge that failure is part of accomplishment, that grazing shallow and holding on to playful <coughs> and even fanciful preoccupations are necessary for creativity? Bernard Suits suggests, the, um, the game theorist and philosopher Bernard Suits, suggests that societies that are more egalitarian may tend to privilege open games that provide opportunities for exploration. And he suggests likewise that hierarchical societies may tend to privilege closed games, those that privilege a goal. Divided societies may not crave only closed games, but ones that demand a winner. So like Francisco Duina, who writes a lot about competition in the United States, and points out that often, particularly in American sports matches, there's a real discomfort with ending a match with a tie. That very often, it, games will go into overtime just so we can be sure to have a winner. So if this is true, I think there, then there's some concern about our current fascination with winning. Um, and some of this is specific to the US, but it's, it's also, um, but I've done a little research about this internationally, that the US is like the most competitive country, the most, the most likely to believe that competition is good, that um, competition reflects effort. The UK tends to be a, very, a pretty close second. So there's something about the um, Anglophone Western capitalist societies that seem to really emphasize competition, particularly at this point in time. Um, this may well, align with the increasing polarization of wealth in these societies. Um, the, the kind of cruelty hurled at losing teams and losing athletes evokes a kind of market fundamentalist ideology that effort and outcome align perfectly, and that a good outcome goes to the person who's put in the most effort. And likewise, that a disappointing outcome necessarily comes from insufficient effort. On the flip side, success in extra economic arenas tends to support capitalist narratives of victory and continual expansion. So this idea that like, winning has to happen at all costs, even though it can't, because competition is based on failure and losing, 
kind of echoes that capitalist idea that it has to get bigger and bigger. It has to expand. The market has to expand. Everyone has to keep getting wealthier when we know that that can't happen, when we know that the capitalist framework is systemically unstable. So I'm, I'm sort of arguing that there is this cultural preoccupation with winning that seems to be really predominant right now is not just a reflection, but a kind of contributor to certain kinds of discourse, larger cultural discourses about success and failure. So where there's competition, there's failure. Now, it seems wholly possible that losing, winning, and everything in between could be handled with respect and acknowledged as part of the competitive framework. It's also wholly possible that we could support more open games that create opportunities to explore dissent and contradiction without always needing to identify a winner. Open games can give us the opportunity to practice disagreement and to acknowledge difference without a fixation on outcome. This suggests that there are possibilities for competitive oppositional play that are nonetheless focused on experience and not on outcome. It also means that we can participate in competitive play without being ruthlessly invested in winning. We can recognize the value of losing as well as winning. And you know, it, this kind of fits with the ideology of sport because we were told that the ability to lose with grace is part of the character building elements of sports. The ability to lose and take from it insight is also a key to transformation and creativity. So in other words, in the same way that in Samuel Beckett's terms, we can fail better, we can lose well. Failing well and losing with immersive attention can benefit us individually and collectively. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, questions, Michael? Oh, thanks very much for that. I, as I was listening to you talking about sparring, as opposed mm -hmm. to kind of professional engagement and so forth, uh, I kept thinking about this book called Music and Social Life by Thomas Torino. Mm -hmm. he, he's talking about a similar phenomenon within the realm of music, and then people who were taught a musical instrument young and immediately gave up because they weren't good enough. They didn't have the talent. Right. And it's basically about the evacuation of pleasure. And, and the elimination of play from an entire realm of activity. And he was talking about, you know, that this then gets bifurcated into uh, professional musicians and the rest of us who are consumers of music. And linking that to this kind of, you know, economic, you know, capitalist social structure and so forth. And what that led me to think about in terms of your talk is that I, I think you are trying to reclaim the value of losing. But what he was pointing out that I thought was interesting is that in certain societies, music is an activity that, by definition, everyone in a village, say, participates in, whether it's dancing, singing, clapping, or whatever. And so there's no, non, there's no audience, right. basically. Everybody's a participant. And an example he gave was a sport example. He said, you know, when we look at professional baseball, we said, you know, we ask certain types of questions about the event. But then when we talk about, say, a pickup softball game, nobody asks who wins. They say, did yeah. you have a good time? Yeah. And, and that really shifts, that the, basically they need to be evaluated by a, a completely different set of criteria. Mm -hmm. and, and sparring in a class is a completely different, by that, by that uh, model, is a completely different activity and needs to be thought about uh, in a different way with a different set of questions. Yeah, for sure. And I think there's kind of, there's two different things going on. Like, I, I, I love the example of, of music and like um, musicians, when I talk to musicians about this idea, they, they bring up often like jamming as another example of that, where it's like a, um, a coming together of profoundly different subjectivities and like working it out, you know? And I think there is really, um, there's a real similarity there between music and sport and it's, um, I think probably true of other creative practices as well, but in like our societal, the Western capitalist societies, like music tends to be one of the few places where people can come together and improvise. Um, social dance sometimes too. Um, 
so there's that element of it that music and other creative practices like provide this space for um, social interaction. Um, and, and there's a real problem, like it's similar to sports, where like young people get excluded from music. And we have this, um, this thing that I call like the outsourcing of play, that like play becomes something that we go and we watch maybe a ballet or, you know, we turn on the TV and watch some boxing or like we listen to music, but we don't actually do it, right? Um, so the losing aspect of it is um, related to creative practice in some ways because I think when you improvise with people, there's always that thing of like, how do you deal with the riff that gets picked up and doesn't go anywhere or where the rhythm fails? Like, there is that element of losing, um, and one of the things that's great about improvisation is it's like, well, you just got to deal with that, and you move on. Um, in thinking about sparring in particular, and I think sports in general, I've sort of fixated on losing and failure because like with martial arts in particular, I think failure is right there front and center because in sparring, like, you're going to get hit. Um, I've sparred with people who are so much better than me, and have managed to hit them at least once. You know, like that's how much failure is, is central. Um, and that idea that like it's going to go wrong and then you adapt to it, like you continually adapt to it, like that to me is um, the beauty of sparring, the excitement, the enjoyment, but also where it works in a really interesting way as a metaphor. And I think that's true of other sports as well. You know, there's always that element, the, the whole liveness of it means that something's going to go wrong and then you adapt to it and then you move forward from that point, which is also kind of connects to creative so practice. I, I guess that I didn't articulate it very well, but I guess um, what I'm thinking about is when you go to a class and you're sparring, mm -hmm. usually afterwards you say, how did it go? You don't say, did you win or lose? Yeah, 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 uh, and, and yeah. That, that's really nice. Right, right, and so it's process, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's process rather than outcome, yeah. Okay, well, um, I liked what you said about the problems with, you know, everybody goes home with a medal. Mm -hmm. um, and my only comment on that would be, I seem to see the same thing happening in many martial arts with early grades where yeah. everybody, you know, everybody gets the grade. Yeah. Um, and I really did have a question which has just gone completely out of my <laughs> mind. <laughs> I'm having a senior moment. Somebody else take <laughs> 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 Sixth, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm not a sports historian, so I couldn't talk about sport, but uh, at least concerning martial arts and combat mm -hmm. sports, I would strongly argue the notion that this, uh, the concentration on winning, is a phenomenon of the Western uh, modern yeah. capitalistic world. Yeah. Because this is the whole deal, what this is all about, and this is the trait of any heroic or warrior ethos that you have, and no yeah. matter on which historical uh, example of combat sports to look, no matter we had Icelandic wrestling in heaven before, um, Greek pancreation, Turkish oil wrestling, no matter what, it is about winning. Mm. Uh, and also like hero heroic poetry is always concentrated on the winner. Yeah. So just to put this into the perspective of, of the uh, history of martial arts, yeah. I think no, I'm, I'm not arguing that winning is a, solely a modern phenomenon. What I was arguing is this sort of fascination we have with winning and this like extreme disparagement of losing, like in a I discomfort with. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. I mean, there are sports historians who argue that sport as a category is an invention of the 19th century and it's an invention of um, capitalism, in effect. That other activities can emphasize besting an opponent but they aren't rooted in sort of the, um, the quantification of the outcome and the sort of, um, a sort of minute, detailed fascination with um, categorizing winning and losing, like we get with modern sport fighting where we have tablets where like this many wins, this many losses. Um, that's sort of a, an argument that like um, Henning Eichberg and other people who work with um, sports ethnography and sports history have made. Um, it's certainly an argument that you can contest because in the interaction, there is always a striving for winning. Um, but I, my, my argument or my contention, I suppose, is that the sort of heightened attention to winning does sort of align with the polarization of society. Um, the other aspect of it is like Bernard Suit's argument about hierarchical versus um, egalitarian societies. 
privileging um, closed versus open games. And so some of the examples you were talking about do come from hierarchical societies, even if they're not Western capitalist ones. And perhaps that sort of celebration of the heroic aligns with the hierarchy. Um, obviously, that's a very big claim that's, that Suits is making, and I'm kind of picking it up and playing with it. Um, but um, one would have to investigate many more examples to really determine whether, that's, whether that fully holds up. Uh, you mentioned that uh, sort of support for Darwinist saying is deliberately inefficient, and I wonder if in some way that serves a, a, an ever more important role, because you know, we're surrounded by technology which makes life ever more convenient, mm -hmm. but at the same time abstracts us ever more from our environment. So sport and martial arts, because they're impractical, force us to interact more with the world, and so and so doing we become more engaged with it. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a possibility there. I mean, I think um, uh, what I was saying is um, games like usually rely on inherently inefficient means and that sports are an extension of games. Um, and so, I mean, one of the ways in which sports brings us into this sort of radical collision with difference of some kind, whether it's the difference between ourselves and others or the difference between ourselves and objects, is um, through these inefficient means because we've made the game more difficult for ourselves. Um, and we do that so we can continue to play. So I think, yeah, that idea that like, um, so much of our work life is about making things more efficient um, because you got to get to the outcome faster, right? And like you, you sort of, um, we tend to neglect the process sometimes. Um, I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, there are people who say that like, um, who make the argument that like a lot of these virtual worlds of the internet also involve a form of play. And I, I wouldn't want to devalue that because I know there are people to, who are deeply invested in that kind of enjoyment that they get from that, that sort of recreational experience. Um, but I think there is something about the physicalized, the inefficiency of means that is a qualitatively very different form of play. Yeah, and I think it serves a particular, um, it, it could serve a particular function in this world where our lives are accelerated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.